Hello, and welcome to this Asia Society webcast, a closer look Indonesia after Jokowi. My name is Remco Tanis. I'm the editorial manager at Asia Society Switzerland. Last Wednesday, Indonesia held the largest single day election in the world, voting not just for president and vice president, but also for a new legislature and close to 18,000 other political offices on all levels of government. Prabowo Subianto, a former general and current minister of defense, was quick to claim victory when the sun set on election day. Pretty much all exit polls indicating he easily got over 50% of the votes required to avoid a second round of voting. That means he will succeed current president Joko Widodo, who remains extremely popular but couldn't run again because he hit the maximum of two terms of five years. Prabowo's win is contributed to his promise to largely continue Widodo's policies, especially the economic ones, with a strong focus on building infrastructure and social programs. But what really sealed his win is having the eldest son of President Widodo, the 36-year-old Gibran, as a running mate, and now incoming vice president of the country. Widodo had to change the country's election laws to accomplish this, a move that critics say further weakened Indonesia's democracy. Today we'll look at Indonesia after Jokowi. Both the outgoing and incoming presidents shared, stated they want to build a golden Indonesia by 2045, when the country celebrates 100 years of independence. They want the country, which is the fourth most populous on the planet and Southeast Asia's largest economy, to radiate leadership and influence on the global stage. We'll talk about what that means, if that's realistic, and what the expectations and priorities of Indonesians themselves are, with three stellar experts from Indonesia. I will introduce uh, you to them in a second. Um, also, in the final 15 minutes of this hour or so, we want to address your questions on Indonesia after Jokowi. You can already submit those questions now and throughout uh, the conversation using the Q&A function on Zoom. If you see a question you really like, feel free to upvote it. That increases the chances uh, of us getting to it later. So that's uh, before we get started with the conversation, let's take a quick look at some basic facts about the country in uh, just a few minutes. So this is where we find Indonesia, the world's largest archipelago nation, with more than 17,000 islands straddled around the equator where the Indian Ocean meets the Pacific. From east to west, the country measures a whopping 5,120 kilometers. To put that into perspective, if you leave from here in Zurich, where I am, in the heart of Europe, go that distance east in a straight line, you end up somewhere around the Pakistani capital of Islamabad. Indonesia's population stands at close to 280 million, making it the fourth most populous nation on earth after India, China, and the US. It's also the world's third largest uh, democracy and with over 85% of the population identifying as Muslim, the most populous Muslim majority country on earth. Indonesia's capital is Jakarta, for now at least, with a metro population of 35 million people, making it the world's second largest urban area after Tokyo. This massive city, however, is sinking at an astounding 17 centimeters a year. Overcrowding and this sinking has led President Widodo to plan for a new capital city, Nusantara, which is now being built in the jungle of Borneo. And here in the white shirt, we see President Widodo looking out at where his new capital city is currently being built. It's slated to be completed by 2045, but already this coming August 17th, Indonesia's Independence Day, it will be formally designated as the country's capital. Quick uh, few little facts about Indonesia's economy. The country has abundant natural resources and is the largest producer of nickel, a crucial substance for batteries powering the global push for a transition to green energy. It also has one of the world's highest deforestation rates. Palm oil plantations are the root cause behind this, which is a hot button topic in long running uh, negotiations between Indonesia and the European Union over a free trade agreement. Palm oil is the second biggest contributor to Indonesia's export revenue. The Indonesian ambassador to Switzerland pointed out the sector is more important to his country than watchmaking is to Switzerland. While talks between the EU and Jakarta are continuing, Switzerland already has an FTA with Indonesia in force since November 2021. Finally, a very brief overview of some important events that bookmarked Indonesia's recent history since the 1945 year of independence. Um, after the Japanese occupation during the Second World War, the Dutch, who had colonized parts or all of Indonesia for more or less the, since the early 1600s, 
They tried to regain control using brutal violence. In 1949, they are defeated and forced to recognize Indonesia's sovereignty. Independence leader Sukarno becomes the country's first president, but his position is undermined by a failed coup attempt in 1965 by the Communist Party of Indonesia. In the purge that follows, under the command of General Suharto, an estimated half to one million people are killed, with another million estimated to be locked up. Three years later, in 1968, General Suharto becomes president. He installs his new order regime, which means, means strongman rule with no room for dissent in Indonesia. His son-in-law is none other than the man who claimed victory in last week's presidential election, Prabowo Subianto, who rises up to become a general in the military under Suharto's rule. Suharto remains in power until 1998. Having been hit hard by the Asian financial crisis, Indonesians suffering from mass unemployment, food shortages, and a corrupt system start violent riots, which ultimately force Suharto to resign, but not after bloody crackdowns and disappearances, for which incoming President Prabowo faced credible accusations of human rights abuses. And Prabowo's history here is the case of the worries about him becoming president, though those worries are mostly coming from outside of Indonesia and from Indonesians old enough to remember the Suharto era. That group is in a minority at the moment. Suharto's fall is the start of a new democratic era for Indonesia. Only six years later, in 2004, the first direct elections for president are held. That's a brief overview. And I'll now introduce you to the speakers that are joining us today. First, uh, from Jakarta, it's Fakrido Susilo, Senior Analyst at Bauer Group Asia, a st strategic advisory firm specializing in the Asia Pacific, where he does policy and regulatory analysis and advocacy for global clients. Fakrido, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Next, Thanks joining from... Me, Next, joining from, from uh, the Australian capital, Canberra, where she pursues her PhD at the Australian National University's College of the Asia Pacific. It's uh, Gita Damayana. She's researching Indonesia's legislative process since democratization started in 1998. Thank you for joining us, Gita. And uh, also joining from Jakarta, it's Josef B. Ramadani, who is the corporate communications lead at Think Policy a platform aimed at improving the public policy ecosystem in Indonesia. Yossi has also been involved with digital platforms, providing young Indonesians with reliable information on the 2024 elections. Thank you, all three of us, uh, all three of you for joining us, I should say. Um, Rido, if I can, can, can start with you with a first question. I was wondering um, how you look back on the election, uh, on last week's elections, and then specifically, how did a 72-year-old Prabowo convince voters who are in majority under 40 that he is the right guy uh, to lead them uh, in the coming years? What do they expect of him? All right. Um, thank you, Remco, uh, for the question. Uh, I think we were we, we, we are all excited about the elec election because, um, again, this marks um, another occasion whereby uh, Indonesians um, were able to hold uh, pretty much um, a stable election, a largely peaceful election. And it was uh, unlike the previous 2019 election, we are seeing a much more peaceful and very less divisive election in uh, uh, this year, in 2024. And um, we are um, uh, hopeful as well that the new president will uh, continue some of the legacies that was that were set by the previous president, President Joko Widodo. And uh, that legacy in particular has to do with the uh, open investment climate and uh, the ways by which, uh, you know, the country was, um, uh, was prepared by Jokowi uh, for uh, investment. So basically, an open investment climate. Um, that's uh, what we're uh, hoping for. And uh, I guess I can say, uh, uh, to a large extent, the business community and investors here are um, satisfied with uh, the election, at least uh, seeing how stable it was and how peaceful it was. And uh, th there will be some uh, sort of uh, policy continuity as well uh, from some of the things, some of the good things 
that President Jokowi has set in place. Mm. I definitely want to get back to um, to the investment and the, uh, the attractiveness of Indonesia as an investment destination, also from abroad, of course. Um, first, if I may, uh, Yossi, a uh, question for you. Um, as I mentioned, people under 40 made up the majority of the electorate in, in these past elections. You belong to that demographic as well. Um, what, what do you consider are some of uh, Jokowi's most important accomplishments for the younger generations over his 10 years in power? And, and what are the biggest challenges and opportunities facing young Indonesians um, under a new president, Prabowo? Yes, um, correct. So 52% of the voters of the 2024 elections are made up by people under 40. So I think for the first time uh, in some time, uh, we make up for the majority of the voters. Um, it has been, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of like make a uniform assumption of all the youth, but then um, there have been different opinions on um, like, on you know, the election itself. But then but then I think it's safe to say that um in its early in its early terms and everything under Jokowi, I think Jokowi was deemed as like the new hope because I think, you know, he he was seen as someone who, you know, rose from like the bottom and then like, you know, was bringing all these new ideas and also bringing all these new infrastructures. I think um in a lot of ways, you know, for you who whose concerns are majorly about, you know, uh, work and also about infrastructure and also access to, you know, like, uh, yeah, about like access and everything. Um, they, uh, Jokowi did bring hope, uh, like early in his term. Uh, however, regarding Prabowo presidency, I think there have been uh, mixed feelings. I think there are some people who are uh, hopeful about it in terms of that he's planning to continue Jokowi's um, plans. And uh, for like mostly like the urbans also uh, the urban youth uh, are has been have been uh, you know kind of happy that this is like maintained and there's not going to be major changes and everything. But there are concerns of um, you know transparency. I mean like there are there are um, infrastructure projects that are going on, but then how it is implemented and whether if it is implemented um, is not aligned with, uh, you know, the concerns of several groups, whether they are able to voice it out and they will not be curbed down. I think uh, because of, you know, certain track records, but uh, I think it has been like a 50-50 uh, point of view from the youth perspective. Yes. Mm. It's, it's, um, Gita, I was wondering, um... We've seen Indonesia in, in recent years, especially during the second term of Jokowi, uh, which started in 2019. Um, we've seen Indonesia drop in, in several international freedom and democracy rankings. Um, a big pain point has been the elimination of independence for the once powerful anti-corruption committee, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I was wondering, is, is that slip in these rankings, is that justified or how, how is that seen in Indonesia itself? And, and maybe also because Jokowi has remained so hugely popular with, with approval ratings up to 80% recently. Um, is it just that most people have other priorities uh, than, than worrying about the civil liberties and, and the, the transparency and democracy? Yes, uh, thank you, Remco, for the for the question. And I will try to answer your question using several fronts um, here. And of course, progressive, activists and civil societies are often only saw the half glass empty approach, but indeed it is concerning on how the pendulum swing. The president uh, popularity are weaponized if uh, against people who are criticizing his policies and political agenda. And this, um, I will be uh, using uh, the social media here as an example. Mm -hmm. If someone is criticizing the uh, particular bill that the government is proposing, there will be hordes of internet trolls who what we who what we call in Indonesia as buzzers on social media who will frame the critic as someone who rejects development. And that's what happened on social media. Indonesians are heavy users of social media. We are the second largest TikTok users, users after the US. And also uh, we are heavy users on Instagram and Twitter. And in another front on the um, provincial level, there are many conflicts between um, people 
uh, rural, rural uh, villagers and big industries in regions far from Jakarta in in Central Java in in Wadas there were conflicts between mining industry against villagers or Rempang recently in in Sumatra uh, between uh, villagers against a national strategic uh, project. In this area, villagers were met with violence done by law enforcement agency who violently suppressed the, the protest. And the final would be on institutional level. The constitutional court where Indonesians file petition against a particular body of law is now being compromised with the president's, president's brother-in-law. Uh, he, he was removed uh, from, the, from his position as the chief of justice for breaching the ethical conduct for passing the law for President Jokowi's son uh, for him to pass as the uh, vice president candidate. As for the anti-corruption commission, the story went far as uh, after the, after uh, Jokowi's being elected on his second term, uh, its stellar reputation and integrity was long gone after President Jokowi uh, administration revising the law, uh, the, revising the commission law, which practically crippled the agency. And um, I think that the discussion now is uh, the Jokowi Kotel effect that was very uh, popular back in 2019. That uh, the popularity of President Jokowi would have an effect of those who we, who are who will be supporting him. And I think that it's still happening right now. People are uh, those the, the middle class uh, are wanted to see um, stability, which uh, Jokowi provides and. Uh, Maybe the working class or the lower class wanted to uh, wanted to uh, wanted to have more, which which uh, Jokowi clearly provides uh, in his uh, during at least in the last uh, in the last uh, couple of months. And all in all, despite it is not new from the Indonesia's history that we are being ruled by authoritarian regime, it is the perfect moment, like the. Uh, Pardon me for being corny here, like the Avengers movie, The Rallying Cry, all the anti-status quo Avengers assemble. Well, it's the perfect moment for that. You mean um it's 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 do you mean then that that's still because the Kotel effect and then uh, Prabowo getting the votes on the coattails of Jokowi and, and running with uh Jokowi's eldest son, that just um is seen as as more advantageous than than securing more transparency or Gita, I have it... to yeah I I I do I really don't like to admit that but I think that seems to be the case mm. that people wanted to have stability instead. Mm. Rito, you you in your first answer you mentioned uh, the investment climate that that Jokowi really improved uh, upon his, his economic legacy is seen as pretty positive overall he he multiplied investment in much needed infrastructure um just last year he he opened the southeast asia's first high speed rail line between jakarta and bandung mm -hmm. um one of his main economic policies has been the so-called downstreaming which uh, led to a ban on the export of raw nickel which is a crucial components of batteries needed to power the global transition to green energy. And with that export ban, Jokowi pretty much forced foreign companies to build nickel processing facilities in Indonesia, which of course increased the value for the country's economy. Um, yet, if you just look at the overall numbers, the, the Indonesia's economic performance and the amount of foreign investment coming in still lags other countries in the region uh, who are also more successful in attracting uh, companies looking for an alternative to China as a place to set up shop. Um, so my question is, while, while Indonesia is Southeast Asia's largest economy by far, it ranks only fifth um, as fifth largest trading partner of the EU in the region, behind Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Thailand. And many foreign investors also complain about the excessive bureaucracy they face, leading them to go elsewhere. Um, we've heard from, from European investors who say they feel kind of lectured to when dealing with Indonesian officials, if they can get an appointment at all. Um, and and I, I saw a nice, or I don't know if it's nice, but uh, I saw a number that said that ex the World Bank concluded uh, that exporters for each shipment they want to export out of Indonesia, they faced 117 hours of paperwork, which is of course a lot more than they face in neighboring countries. So my question would be, um, you mentioned earlier that Jokowi has improved these things, but it's apparently not enough just yet. Um, what, what do you make of all this? And, and what do you advise your global clients who, who maybe want to try setting up shop in, in Indonesia? Right. 
of course, uh, this is a major undertaking, right? Uh, reforming the bureaucracy and the governance, and it doesn't happen overnight. But um, some of the things that President Jokowi did during his uh, presidency, and still does, because he is still the uh, president, right? Um, was one of the landmark policy was the issuance of uh, the omnibus law. Um, mm -hmm. Despite all uh, its downside, right? Um, mm -hmm. It is a major milestone in Indonesia's investment landscape, along with the annulment of the negative investment list, right? So if you're looking at the uh, landscape of Indonesia's, uh, Indonesian investment today versus uh say 10 to 15 years ago it's much more open and um you can certainly feel that uh you know positive a lot of the positive things are going on there um i should also mention here that perhaps uh during this year's election it actually marks uh the first time that uh major businesses and investors are not pausing their investment despite uh, the election. So it's uh, something good, something uh, positive. So Indonesia's uh, investors' confidence in Indonesia's uh, political climate has also been uh, high. Uh, like I said, right? No, no pausing of any major uh, business or investment decision. Um, and it has largely to do with uh, Jokowi's ability to um, direct the state apparatus to have a, a pro-investment attitude. So this can be seen from how ambassadors, for example, during Jokowi, have their performance measured uh, through how much foreign investment they can bring to the country, among others, right? Uh, permitting has also been mostly digitalized, simplified, and streamlined through what we call now as the uh, online uh, single submission system, or OSS. Uh, Jokowi has also attempted to trim the bureaucracy and eliminated many low level structural bureaucratic positions uh, that can lengthen red tape. So some of the things, uh, some of these things have been undertaken uh, during his presidency. Uh, we, we do acknowledge that uh, corruption still happens, uh, but this very, very rarely involves uh, foreign investment or businesses. Um, there is a tacit understanding among the bureaucrats here that foreign investors are not to mess with. Mm. They are important for building a positive investment climate and driving the economy. Uh, some of the challenges that we're still facing include you know, streamlining and clarifying um, various implementing regulations, uh, which can sometimes be uh, overlapping or prone to different interpretations by uh, different agencies. So I would say uh, to uh, you know potential investors uh, of Indonesia, uh, if you come to Indonesia, uh, make sure um, you get the right uh, advisor for uh, policy and regulatory affairs. <laughs> I'm sure you know a few. Uh, <laughs> is but just a quick uh, quick question uh, to follow up though. Um, these other countries in the region are also, of course, doing the same thing, attempting to attract more foreign investors and making it easier. Indonesia is still lagging. Do, do you expect um, that that gap that it still has with its neighbors to, to, to become smaller under Prabowo? Or does more need to be done to, to get that gap uh, closed? Right. Uh, I look at the number, actually, last night, Remco, just to anticipate this kind of question, right? And um, it looks uh, a lot more um, uh, a lot more brighter compared to a couple of years ago. Actually, there was a slump during the COVID 2020, right? But now Indonesia, in terms of uh, foreign direct investment inflow, stands just below uh, Singapore uh, on the numbers, right? So we are ahead of uh, Malaysia and Vietnam and Thailand, which are um, usually regarded as our uh, quote unquote competitors when it comes to attracting uh, foreign direct investment. So um, I would say uh, that's an improvement and certainly there are lots of things to be. So uh, like Magita said, uh, businesses is part of the civil um, society community here as well in Indonesia. And uh, 
we are the driving force behind uh, the push for uh, reforms in uh, business climate and investment as, as well. And hopefully uh, we will be able to do so in the years to come. Mm. Uh, you'll see um, one of the business or the sectors that has that has been doing pretty well in, in Jakarta, notably. Uh, Jakarta has become Southeast Asia, Asia's most successful incubator for new tech uh, companies. Um, it's kind of like the Silicon Valley of Southeast Asia, I guess. Um, was a fact I didn't really realize. I was wondering, do you notice that in the city? Like, like is there is there a change? Uh, do you do you see like everybody's just focused on I want to work for a tech company or, and then second, is the education system actually equipped to 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 educate people um, for these new economy new, new companies that that flood to Jakarta? Yeah, sorry for the background noise. I hope my voice is still um, audible. Um, okay, so. Probably uh, six years ago, I think and that's where it's when it started. You know, you know, you start seeing all these like major tech companies, you know, coming to Indonesia and then like expanding, moving to like bigger offices, and then like you start seeing like all these signs of tech companies. Um, it did feel like that until up until after COVID. I think there were a lot of major layoffs uh after that i mean I, uh so i think because of covid it kind of slowed down for a bit but i do feel that there are still some uh like spirit in terms of like restoring the tech industry in indonesia um, i think it's still one of the go-to industry for a lot of the youth um i think you ask a lot of the people in Jakarta, uh, well, like, uh, you know, like the fresh graduate, where, where do you want to go to work? I think most of them will still name some of like the surviving tech companies who are still operating in Indonesia. Um, in terms of education, um, I, I think uh, more has to be done in terms of making sure that it's not just the uh, you know, to make sure that it's not just people in the city, like the students in the city that can get like job tech jobs, but also like people in the rural area, because there, there's definitely like gaps mm -hmm. in education um, in terms of, you know, uh, tech especially, right? Because the like knowledge, technical knowledge, um, I think is right now it's accessible for people who are living in big cities in Indonesia, like, you know, Surabaya, in uh, Jakarta, Bandung, but then like it's sometimes it's still unattainable for people who are still living for in in the rural area. So um, yeah, so we just need to make sure that you know there's a transfer of knowledge between um, people who are in the city because then if uh, I think some e-commerce companies are trying to do that in terms of like you know making sure that the small medium businesses are uh, you know using all these uh, online platforms. To kind of like sell their businesses and etc. I, I think there has been efforts, but uh, more has to be done to make sure that you know they are they're not yeah so they, that they can also enjoy the technological advances that is happening in Indonesia right now. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. I, I want to sh shift the focus a bit to um, Indonesia's foreign policy and its position um, in in the world. Um, Gita, I, I read, I hadn't heard of him, but John Riadi, is, is that how I pronounce his name or? Yeah. Yes, okay. Riadi, yeah. John, uh, he's, he, he joked, uh, he's a prominent investor, uh, businessman. He, he joked Indonesia is the biggest, the planet's, the, sorry, let me rephrase that. Indonesia is the planet's biggest invisible object. Um, Indonesia has always been proud of, of its free and active foreign policy, as, as the government calls it. It seems to have found a nice balance between um, being attractive to China as a trade and investment partner, while being attractive to the U.S. as, as a democratic uh, stronghold in, in the Indo-Pacific. Indo um, but some would call it being remarkably absent, right? Jokowi famously hardly ever or never attended the U.N. General Assembly in New York. Um, and it's leaving observers both inside and outside the country, including former Foreign Minister uh, Martina Talegawa, wondering what Indonesia actually wants on the world stage and uh, in a world that's increasingly in crisis mode. Um, it's a huge country, a huge economy. It has 280 million people. 
The question is, is it punching below its weight on the world stage? Does it not want to do more? Should it want to do more? Um, what what can we expect from Probovo on this on this field, Pita? Yes. Um, first of all, I need to have a disclaimer here that I'm no uh, international relation um, professional here. I have no um, training on that, no nor education on that. But maybe I would like to think that Prabowo, since he said that he will continue uh, Jokowi's uh, policy, that the current path that Jokowi's uh, tread at the moment, he will, he will, um, he will. Um, he will um he will be following Jokowi's path, but maybe what uh what maybe not just foreigners, but maybe uh Indonesians should be very well aware of that uh Jokowi and Prabowo they are very, they have a very different personality. So I I'm sorry. Um if there would be uh, some kind of situation in the future where there will be a spontaneous response or spontaneous reaction from Prabowo. Well, nobody should be surprised if those kind of thing happened. Maybe well, that's the uh, closest thing I could I could say on this. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what you mean? They have a different type of personality. What are the main differences between the two men? Well, we can say like socially, they have a very different background. Jokowi was raised in Central Java in a more rural um, rural settings. Well, well, Prabowo, on the other hand, he was the son of a minister from the Sukarno's era, and he was raised in Europe. And I think maybe I think he was raised in Switzerland at some yeah. point in his life, but in in, in Europe. So yes, he is right. very he's a very westernized. He has a very westernized um, uh, influence in his in his uh in his in his uh character very different from Jokowi who was uh have his education all in all in Indonesia all in all in Java very different from uh Prabowo and also Prabowo he was the son-in-law of Indonesia's um uh second president Suharto and he was to say that he saw in his uh he saw everything on 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 the on the front row seat all the events evolving in his Indonesian history, he saw it on the front row seat, very different from Jokowi. And this would make a very different, if you have this kind of experience as a person, it would give you a very different trajectory mm. for the future. That's that's my take on this. Okay, thank you. Rito, I was wondering, um, as Gita said, uh, with Prabowo having a bit of a more Western education than, than Jokowi, um, We've, we've seen, of course, tensions around the South China Sea with, with China becoming more assertive there. Um, Indonesia also has some, some discussions with China on, on where the border is exactly. But somehow, if you compare it to how uh, Vietnam and especially the Philippines are, are dealing with China, um, it seems to fly a bit under the radar with, with Indonesia. Do you think Prabowo would be a bit more assertive on that point uh, as well, being an old uh, military man as well? Right. Uh... I would like to bring this discussion on foreign policy to at least three lens, right? Mm -hmm. So we should look at uh, 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 we should look it into uh, the lens of um, ASEAN, this is the Indonesia, and what Jokowi has done so far, and what Prabowo uh, would do uh, for his presidency in the future, right? So uh, with regards to the first, uh, if you ask any major uh, foreign policy scholars out there on um, uh, on what contributes to ASEAN success, I think we can safely say that it is Indonesia's willingness to refrain from becoming a hegemon in the region, right? So in that sense, uh, I think the stability and the success of ASEAN as a regional organization is pretty much owed to Indonesia. And Indonesia will continue to become an anchor in ASEAN, especially since uh, it has been a source of stability and economic growth uh, for the region. And with regards to what Jokowi has done uh, during his presidency, I think uh, contrary to what many people um, assume so far, I mean, initially perhaps uh, we, we saw Jokowi as not attending the UN General Assembly and so on, but uh, I personally think that uh, Jokowi has an international or global aspiration. Uh, what becomes his primary concern is how to elevate Indonesia so we can stand on equal footing at least economically, with developed countries. And this has been, I guess, his major focus. 
And this is clear from his foreign policy priorities in recent years, such as, you know, uh, becoming the uh, president, uh, assuming the presidency of the G20 group and aspiring to become a member of o o OECD. So his foreign policy agenda is largely driven by uh, economic development and economic rationales. With regards to Bra Prabowo, uh, I think we can also safely say that Prabowo is, uh, has long been a, an ardent student of history, global affairs, and geopolitics. You can see this from his speeches, from the book that he has written. Um, you know, I think we can expect a more uh, geopolitically active uh, Indonesia uh, under him. Uh, and, uh, you know, to answer your question on uh, this whole dynamics of U.S.-China relation, I think uh, uh, the decision to uh, procure military equipment from uh, countries outside China, for example, uh, that largely shows uh, his view on the need to balance the relation between uh the West and the East. I think that's my take on, on, on foreign policy. Does, does Europe fit in any in anywhere uh, regarding Indonesia's um, attempt to just remain pretty much non-aligned and then choose a balance between the in the, the sorry the, the US China uh, relationship struggle? I would say uh, Europe has always been a uh, partner for Indonesia. Uh, we have a business group called um, Euro Chamber of Commerce here, and it has been uh, actively uh, holding activities, events uh, to promote closer ties uh, between Indonesia and um, Europe in, in terms of business, economy, and investment, right? And uh, don't uh, undermine uh, the role that civil society actors play as well. So people like us, for example, this kind of discussion, this kind of um, seminars, uh, events, whatever you call it, right? I mm -hmm. think it will bring uh, closer ties in terms of people to people uh, relations between uh, Europe and Indonesia. And closer people to people relations is basically what initiates uh, business relations in the first place. So more events like this, Ramco, please. Right, right. <laughs> My next question is, is for you, Yoshi. But first, uh, just a quick follow-up, if I may, um, uh, if I may, uh, with, with, with Rito, because you, you mentioned something in your answer just now, and, and Proboa has been quite critical, if not outright anti-European in his campaign. He, he, at one point, I think in November, um, made a statement that Europe isn't relevant anymore. We don't need you anymore. Just don't just get out of here. Get out of the room pretty much. Um, what does that mean now that he, he, he'll he become the president and he'll have to preside over the negotiations with a free trade agreement, but also take Europe seriously, perhaps on other or need it as a partner on other geopolitical issues um, if, if he was so staunchly critical and anti-Europe in his campaign? Uh, Rito, sorry, that's could you just... All right, yeah. So I'm seeing uh, the questions, and uh, this is uh, coming from the audience, right? So yes, uh, that's right. Right. I think um, my 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 answer to that would be uh, we need to uh, differentiate between um, uh, a politician on stage between mm. when he is uh, becoming uh, when he's running the day to day daily administration, right? And uh, what a politician sometimes uh, conveys on stage does not necessarily reflect what is going to happen uh, in terms of the uh, administration, in terms of the daily routine of the government. I think whoever assumes the seat of uh, presidency in Indonesia would have to increasingly realize the role that Europe or any other uh, powers in the world play, especially when it comes to um, investment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when, when, when we're talking about politics, uh, we can we can't just talk about the politicians. 
uh, but we also have uh, the bureaucrats and we also have the other actors who set the agenda, right? So people like us in the civil society, we are an actor to politics. Businesses are actors to politics too. And uh, bureaucrats uh, who play, who largely set uh, some of the agendas in lots of different ministries in Indonesia, they would have a role to play too. And for them, I would say a business as usual approach would be uh, better rather than, you know, uh, radical change. Mm. And in that regard, I would say we can uh, safely uh, place our bet on uh, the adept diplomats uh, that Indonesia has uh, in its foreign service, right? They will steer Indonesia from veering too much or radically veering from, you know, uh, the course that's been set now. Thank you. It's Yossi, a question for you is um, you, you've been involved over the past election uh, with a platform trying to provide young voters with, with relevant, reliable information on, on politics and politicians. Um, of course, in, disinformation has been a huge challenge on in elections the world over. Um, how big a challenge was it to, to provide reliable information to the voters of Indonesia? And Maybe a second question is, um, what role has Jokowi's government or Prabowo's campaign been playing in either uh, battling or spreading disinformation? Yes, um, it has been quite challenging. So I, I think a little bit of background of uh, the project uh, Bijak Mamili, or can be translated as quote wisely, is that we provide very concise, digestible information regarding like all the candidates in terms of their track record and also their vision and mission. Uh, thankfully, we managed to get like 4.1 million views in total, um, which I think like around 1 million of them was like uh, we gained overnight like one day before the voting day. Uh, but yeah, anyways, um, in terms of misinformation, it has been quite complicated for this one because not only that we're dealing with a lot of new challenges, including uh, AI content and also buzzers and everything like that. But I think also... It's it's the post truth uh, era, right? Where it, you can't really call it lies; it's just perspective. So I think like that's what has been really hard on like you know labeling as to like what's right and what's not. I think there is a portion of you that are critical and is are aware of the this whole post truth era, and they kind of see because. I think most youth now gain uh, like look for information through social media. I think some of them are aware that this is a post truth era, and whatever they find on the internet has to be taken as like a you know an, a, pers a perspective or opinion, and then they have to weigh on that. But then there are a lot of portion of youth also who don't have the time to do that, or like still see it as you know right or wrong or like as the ultimate truth or not. So um, in terms of the campaign of uh, Joko and also Prabhu, I think they have been playing a lot on, you know, the post-truth aspect of it. Uh, like after every, like uh, before the election, uh, the commission of the general election held five debates in total. And after the debate, Twitter and TikTok would have different reality. Like uh, uh, Twitter would see like Prabowo's answers as disappointing, but then like on TikTok, he would be like a total hero, definitely. Yeah. So that's what's so interesting in this election, uh, in terms of seeing that gap between like platforms. And I think their campaign team has been very strategic in setting up as to like, let's say if he says something that it's not too strategic in terms of you know the debate i think like their campaign team has been really good in setting up the narrative as to like you know that's exactly what uh you know like you know making them feel sorry for him for example or you know or that he's the leader that exactly that we need and etc so i think that's what's been quite interesting to see like the phenomenon um and this election specifically yes mm. thank you and gita i was wondering um one of the 
best known facts about Indonesia is, is that it's the world's largest Muslim majority country. Uh, over 85% of the population identifies as, as Muslim. I was wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about um, what is the role of, of Islam in government, if any, and, and um, has it been changing with Yokoi? Do you expect that to change with, with Prabowo? And maybe uh, to, to add a question of, of some of the audience to that, um, some, some people are referring to they fear that under Prabowo, tensions might increase between either ethnic groups or, or religious groups in Indonesia. Um, what, what, what is your view on that? Oh, very interesting question. And um, I think most of the Indonesian voters would see that in, in this election, in the, in the 2024 election, there's the absence of the identi identity politics uh, played at this uh, election. Very, very different from what we had back in 2019 or in 2016 in the Jakarta uh, governor election where there was a political identity uh, political identity political identity approach were being used by uh, by either camp by one of the camps to um to attack each other and we see the absence of that and i think there's a very interesting piece by a colleague of mine in the new mandala blog post by NAFA that the that those who are accused using political identity right now are um they really uh, lay low and do not use the do not use the term they were using back in 2019 so i think in a way uh, uh the way uh Jokowi's administration approach to uh, suppress the uh uh let's just say islamic islamist uh, con uh conservatives are working and it's and it's not anymore uh, a preferable approach when you want to attack someone politically if you if you want to use uh, religion in this case however however this is the however part in relation to uh, your uh, introduction at the first place about the uh, about how the uh, anti-corruption commission being crippled by the Joko administration uh, uh, some of the elites are using the are using uh, the term of there are lots of what they refer as Taliban's in the anti corruption commission. So that's why the they need to be um, they need to be tamed down by the new law. So in a way that in a way the the horizontal uh, the horizontal um, conflicts between people are much more. Uh, we, I can maybe I could say that's the almost zero cases no longer happen, but some but the issue are being used by elites to if they want to uh, break down that they they want to neutralize certain agencies certain institutions that they don't want to see them working very well like the anti corruption commission. Rido, I was wondering, um, Indonesia has has kind of politely declined the invitation from, from the BRICS to, to join the forum uh, last year, the, the BRICS, the, the forum of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Um, on the other hand, next door is, of course, uh, Australia, uh, which which uh, also has formed some, some smaller alliance with AUKUS, um, with, with the US and the UK. What is, what is Indonesia um, going to do here do you expect is it is it just going to politely deny getting too involved with either side or will it impact australia relationships with australia which which of course is is, is a big neighbor for for indonesia what what, what do you expect will happen with prabowo uh, at the wheel right. um i wouldn't say that it would uh i wouldn't say that indonesia australia relations would be um Arm in any way. Um, uh, if any, we are hoping, uh, and as, as an alumni of uh, an Australian university here, uh, I'm certainly hoping for uh, a much closer um, relation. Right. In fact, uh, I know that um, Prabowo uh, had visited Australia during his. Uh, uh, during his uh, he's made uh, visits to Australia as a, a minister of defense, right? So um, I wouldn't say uh, there is uh, anything uh, of major uh, concern there, Remco. Mm, okay. 
I was wondering, um, one of the one of the big things, of course, that gave Prabowo the push uh, to 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 become president uh, when he makes it to inauguration day in October, um, is the fact that Jokowi was able to um, put his son in the vice presidential seat. Um, Yossi, is that something that people really really thought? Okay, now a vote for Prabowo actually just means a vote for the Jokowi dynasty, and and then that will continue, and we don't care. That much about Prabowo, it's much more about the Jokowi legacy continuing. Um, how, 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 how was that influential, you think? Um, definitely influential. I think it's, uh, you know, previously we can see how Prabowo was not, I mean, his vote has been quite consistent in terms of percentage, like, uh, you know, before where he tried, but um, I think definitely Jokowi's endorsement and also Gibran is there and um, uh, Prabowo has been repeating Jokowi's uh, program over and over and again like in his campaign definitely plays a part I think um, at least on social media the discussion has been um, both people who uh, hates or loves the, uh, Prabowo's, uh, and Jokowi's administration has been um, using like uh, it has been portraying Prabowo as a continuation of Jokowi's, uh, you know, dynasty. Um, so I, I, I'm quite sure that it's definitely a matter of continuation, and it is seen as a continuation of a dynasty. And you know, whether people agree with it or not, I, I think, yeah, definitely tied. But I think. The question is whether Prabhu will actually follow the plan, right? Isn't it that um, because sometimes there are there were example as to like you know where Prabhu has his own takes and opinions, you know, and sometimes it just comes out in the moment. Um, so I think that we shouldn't be too naive as to like seeing, you know, oh, you know, this will be all the plans that are set by Joko is going to be continued because I think like Prabowo is also his own personality, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be really interesting to see uh, for the years to come. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the final question for all three of you. Um, Gita, if I can start with, with you. Um, if you if you can name one development, one thing that you hope will have um, changed significantly by the time the next presidential election in twenty twenty nine rolls along, um, what would that be? What would you hope that has really been 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 dealt with? Well, I um, so you you mean my hope for the two thousand twenty nine? Is that what you're? Yeah, or what 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 major issue you feel should have really been tackled or should have been changed uh, that is still an issue now, but maybe not anymore by that time or has improved a lot? Well, maybe this is, um, maybe this is to, uh, maybe this is a very naive for me mm -hmm. to have a hope on this, but I really hope that the, uh, the Prabowo administration would revoke the anti-corruption commission law and return it to the previous law. Maybe that would be too far fetched for for uh, for me. But and the other would be what I wanted not to be changed would be that the uh, how the president being elected and how the um, all the president how the president being elected the governor and the regional leaders being elected. So it's still the a direct election compared to uh, election by the general assembly or the uh, house of representatives. Sorry, can you can clarify? You would like to to have direct elections for president continue, but yes, yes, yeah, because there were talks that uh, during I think two two years ago that uh, the president would be uh, would be would be elected by the general assembly instead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Josie, how about you? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Okay. I was just wondering if you can name uh, one element, one topic, one thing that you. Um, Feel feel passionate about that you hope will change for the better in in the next five years, so that by the time the next presidential election comes along, you can say okay that that that's a lot better than it was in twenty twenty four. I mean, I don't know if it's, I I don't know if this is a pessimistic or optimistic view, but uh, I really as 
part of the youth and I think this is also repeated by my fellow uh, Indonesian youth uh, I think we really hope that um, government remains open in terms of feedback especially in the imp- implementation of strategic project including the um, in the capital city I mean like I think I think regardless it will still be done anyway in terms of the capital city but it's not a matter of whether we will move the capital city or not it's more on like how will we approach it i really hope that there will be more open you know feedback in terms of you know making sure that the local people in borneo are getting the the, the you know their rights and also their the compensation if it's needed and then like you know and regarding environment also like it's you know it's um uh, we don't have much time and I really hope that you know the government remains open to hearing you know what would be good for our climate moving forward also yeah I think it's, that's all for me it's, it's definitely one of the most um the biggest stories that that speaks to the imagination of people outside of Indonesia that this new city is being built in the in the jungle of, of Borneo and uh, at quite a speed uh, I should say um Rido, how about you? Uh, what what are things that you hope for um, will change uh, in the next five years? Right. Um, so I do really hope that Indonesia would be able to uh, utilize more of its soft power influence, actually, in order to uh, make it a uh, truly global player. Because the way it currently plays out, uh, Indonesia is still not punching above its weight when it comes to the utilization of its um, soft power, it has so much potential, but it is still uh, underexplored. And I've written an article on it uh, that was uh, recently uh, published by the Lowy Institute. Um, so take, for example, our neighboring country, Thailand, right? Uh, Thai dishes is the most, uh, is the third most popular Asian food uh, in the US with over 10,000 outlets. Indonesia, uh, Indonesia uh, does have some of the most delicious foods in the world, which is uh, globally recognized as well. It's been featured everywhere as the most delicious foods, right? Rendang, uh, gado-gado are uh, some of the most popular out there. But uh, how come they are not as popular as Thailand? So perhaps uh, our government and the next administration should really pay attention to that, you know? Uh, Mm. Make some of these cultural aspects uh, of Indonesia uh, becoming the main source of strength for its uh, foreign policy and in its aspiration to become a global player. And judging from the case of Thailand, Korea, uh, it certainly needs orchestrated uh, policies from both the government and the uh, business actors. So uh, one main takeaway that I would like the audience to have from this webcast is the next time uh, you are hungry, find an Indonesian restaurant nearby and order gado gado uh, instead of um, <laughs> Western salad. <laughs> Great advice. And I feel like they've been listening to you already. Um, as just earlier this uh, this morning, I uh, we, we got an invitation to an Indonesian evening here in Zurich organized by the Indonesian embassy in Switzerland. So maybe they're, they're just a step ahead of you already, uh, Rido. Um, thank you very much. Um, I've, I've received some recommendations from from you, uh, from all of you, about sources where people can go uh, if they want to know more about Indonesia and what's going on in Indonesia. We'll post them online. Thank you so now uh, for now, um, and that's all for a closer look uh, Indonesia after Jokowi. By the way, also out today is a special episode of our uh, podcast State of Asia. In it, I speak with Mega Purnamasari from Bali and Yus Kenewas, who is in uh, in Jakarta. And each bring their unique perspectives as well on what's going on in Indonesia. So if you search for State of Asia in your podcast app, you'll you'll find it right there. For everything else, visit asiasociety.org slash Switzerland for an overview of all our events and other activities and to sign up for our weekly newsletter. A big thank you again to our speakers today, Fakrido Susilo, Gita Damayana, and Yossi Ramadani. Thank you very much for your uh, insights. And I wish you a very great evening. And to you, the audience, thanks for your questions and interests. As always, we appreciate your feedback. You can leave that um, as soon as this webcast ends. You'll see a little form. Thank you again, all of you. Until next time, bye-bye.